We're now transitioning into our closing session. And this topic is incredibly important. You may not know, but this COP is the first time that we have had health as a day. And if the first time we're really thinking about the integrated wellness of our planet and our people. So I'm very excited that this final panel discussion today is going to be on health is wealth, prioritizing the consumer. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Nirenberg, president of, food, of the food tank, to join the stage and lead us in this incredible discussion. Welcome, Thank Daniel. So much. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. I'd like our panelists to join. If our panelists can join, that would be great. What a pleasure to be here on this beautiful stage. I'm so grateful to the organizers. Let's give them a round of applause, please, for putting together such a wonderful session and a whole day of programming. This is very difficult to do, especially during COP. And so this is like, I think, a, a little bit of a sanctuary for all of us to come and have different kinds of conversations. So, Again, my name is Danny Nierenberg. I'm president and co-founder of an organization called Food Tank. We're a research and advocacy organization that really highlights stories of hope and success in our food and agriculture systems around the globe. And we do that with the, the aim to motivate, inspire, and ultimately activate positive transformation in how we produce and consume food. So I love this theme that we're going to be discussing today, that health is wealth. Um, so I want to just jump right in and briefly introduce our panelists. Um, in no particular order. So in the middle, we have Namakulo Kovic, the Regional Director of East and Southern Africa for the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. Um, and she sits at ILRI, which is the International Livestock Research Institute. We have um, Bruce Friedrich, who I've known for a very long time, the President of the Good Food Institute. Adele Jones, the Executive Director of the Sustainable Food Trust, which is a wonderful organization that I hope many of you will uh, follow after this discussion. Uh, Sirav Roy, the CEO and co-founder of the Center for Big Synergy, and I'm excited to learn more about your work. And Afshan Khan, the UN Assistant Secretary General and Coordinator at the Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Movement. So I want to thank you all so much for being here. Let's give them another round of applause so we keep the energy up. And I would encourage you all, as we have this discussion, to interrupt, interrupt me, interrupt one another, build on what one another says. I want this to be as dynamic as possible. Um, Afshan, I, I'd like to, to start with you. We are experiencing multiple crises right now. There's this poly crisis of the food insecurity situation that's going on across the world, our climate crisis, public health challenges, conflict. And I'm wondering if you can sort of, sort of I guess, set the stage for what Sun is, is doing to address these multiple crises. Thanks, Danny. It's really a pleasure to be here and, and, and join this panel. And I'm really thrilled that uh, as we were introduced, it was very clear that we're bringing together for the first time at this COP climate, health, and, and nutrition in a very clear way, and agri-food systems, obviously. So first thing I want to say is that, um, you know, climate is neither nutrition nor gender neutral. Climate change really is impacting nutrition significantly. Um, we see that this crisis that's come together now of climate, increased food prices, um, and uh, conflict, have created an, a series of issues where we have more than 3.2 billion people uh, across the globe that cannot afford and access healthy diets. And this is really worrisome because that means that about 45% of child deaths are due to malnutrition. And that malnutrition is a strong intersection between poor health, often due also impacted by climate, whether it's drought, whether it's floods, and an increased sp uh, spread of disease. And that is really increasing the number of child deaths as well. We were just talking earlier, and you know, sometimes it's not understood what the longer term impact of malnutrition is as well. Uh, a malnourished child, particularly a stunted child, has a 40% less chance of strong neurological development. And that cannot be caught up after three years of age. So their, their opportunity to reach their full potential is really impacted by the maternal health and how that child is uh, in utero, but it's also the first thousand days being a critical component for full development of children. 
Now, when it comes to Sun and what we're doing, uh, Sun as a movement is country driven, country led, 66 countries spread across uh, the globe, very much focused on bringing together networks. That includes government led, but with participation of civil society, the United Nations, so all the agencies that work in, in nutrition and health and climate, I would say, um, and bringing together also um, civil society, business, UN and government, and also looking in some places, and Namkulo is a great witness to this, the academic network. Right. So bringing what's the best practice and the best research that's out there in country that can make the most difference for informing and shaping uh, policy choices that many countries have to make and, and the policy di dialogue. So we at Sun are very committed also to supporting national nutrition plans, country-driven, country-led, identifying how these networks, including the Sun Donor Network, can support those plans, and then equally seeing how these link to the nat nationally determined contributions, the NDCs for climate action, and to see how many of those reflect nutrition and how is climate reflected in those nutrition plans? Sure. sure. I, I'm wondering, and, and maybe Surav can jump in here too, but Afshan, you started off this conversation saying, you know, this is really the first time that climate, health, and nutrition have been linked in a clear way at COP. Why did it take so long? You know, I think initially the climate change debate was very focused on the science of climate change, and rightly so because it was disputed. So there was a need for clear data and evidence and what to do about it. When you think about what influences people, it's an understanding of how does this impact me, right? And for many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the how we impact, how this has impacted individuals is not a thought for tomorrow. Sure. It's life today. Yeah. It's manifest in the malnutrition rates. It's manifest through floods and droughts, loss of livestock, loss of income, and it's manifest through the massive displacement that we've seen in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel. So this is very real. Yeah. And in a way, the priority actions, the commitments that are made now, and how those are rolled out into specific plans is where the rubber is going to hit the road. And sure. it's, this is not a long-term forecast for change. This is really lived experience. Thank you so much. Surav, can you build on what Afshan has been talking about? What are the biggest global challenges that are facing uh, the, the, the Global South? What are the biggest challenges that are facing the Global South right now? Sure. Thanks, first of all, to Climate Action to give me the opportunity to join the panel. And um, I belong to the Global South, so I've been living in the Global North for the last 20 years or so, but I do come from the Global South and uh, still have roots there. So um, I do understand the differences that um, everyone experiences here versus there. So um, first and foremost, um, belonging from a smallholder farming family, I understand the ground realities of uh, what farmers face there. Um, so if you ask me, from my very simple observation and experiences, the first one obviously is lack of knowledge mm. and understanding of new technologies. Uh, a small holder um, farmer doesn't consider his or her land as a business or an enterprise. It is essentially their, you know, something where they, in a place where they grow their own food. Now that ideology has to change or to evolve uh, to make them understand that it could be an enterprise not just supporting themselves, but the others as well around them, and to ensure food security that's you know, uh, of, of utmost importance. Uh, second thing, obviously, is investment. And I think uh, over the course of the day, we've heard from so many other panelists what the challenges are and where the risks are and how those, those could be de-risked to an extent. Um, and the third, obviously, is uh, the general evolution of um, thinking around the entire thinking around food, food habits, consumption behavior. Um, because I can tell you from a subtle observation, over the last 10 years or so, uh, whenever I visit India, I see all the roadside inns, so these mm -hmm. were small eateries around uh, the country on the highways, vanishing. Sure. So they're not, no longer serving local produce, 
uh, regional food. They've all been replaced by multinational fried chicken um, franchises. Sure. So as you can understand, if that's the behavior now that has come upon, that will have an entirely different kind of uh, pressure on the food production and the agri-food industry. Now, if we are not able to help people evolve, how they think about food, what they associate as prestige, so to say, in a way of, you know, I've made it in life if I can have KFC. I will take a picture on uh, WhatsApp or on um, uh, Instagram and share it and get 1,000 likes. Sure. That is the aspiration. Is that right? How can we help them evolve it while we still balance commerce as well as agri-food? So I think these three are the key challenges I see as to you know, how we could help evolve the global south. Thank you, Sirav. To, to address these challenges, Namakulo, the UN Food System Summit happened in, in 2021, and then there was a stock-taking moment uh, earlier this year in July. And I think one of the things that it did is it, you know, it brought so many countries together to talk about resilience and, and you know, to those multiple crises we're, failing, or we're facing that we, we talked about before. Um, but one of the things that I think is still lacking is the investment that's needed at the regional and local levels to address some of the things that Surav was just talking about. And I'm wondering how we encourage local policymakers to make better decisions that will help small-scale farmers and will help ultimately eaters or consumers. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you, you referred to uh, the UN Food Systems Summit. And I think it presents quite an interesting entry point um, into thinking of what we need to invest on. I think it's, it's the first time, at least in my lifetime, that you've had so many countries trying to do the same thing on trying to move towards sustainable food systems at the same time. So you have those pathways that were developed by countries which are now either gonna sit on the shelves or need to be invested in to move us forward. So currently, if I use Ethiopia, which is the country that I am best in as an example, um, they developed quite a robust food systems transformation pathway and since then, they've actually taken food systems transformation and made it an overarching framework. They've included nutrition, um, in that umbrella, all food and agriculture related interventions in that umbrella. And the approach that is being taken is asking everybody to identify their entry points to contribute, uh, taking a visionary approach. Sure. So they've put forward a vision where the idea is to uh, have a holistic transformation of the food system. It takes into account uh, bringing on board uh, production practices that are sustainable. And so it's, it's a big government process. So the question then in terms of investment is, what do the different food systems actors do and invest in to actually contribute to that common vision. So regardless of where you are at in food systems, everybody has their unique entry points, and their vision then tells you which direction to go in. If you are in transport, you get the food safe to the market. Right. If you are in production, what production practices are you investing in? If you are in processing, don't load them with sugar and salt and, and what have you. So everybody has an entry point and having a common vision then gives you um, really an idea of what you ought to invest in yeah. if you are to contribute positively towards attainment of that vision. So I think just looking at those pathways is an important way of finding how to invest. But I think for the continent as a whole, for Africa, what we've also seen is an effort at African Union level, looking at common threads across different countries to develop a common position on food systems transformation. Again, that offers opportunities to identify what is it that you need to invest in to take us to that vision? Because then there is a continental vision as well. Can you give some examples of what those, those countries who have common threads are trying to invest in sort of collectively? 
Um, one that stands out is to take traditional and indigenous foods and consider them as part of the food systems transformation yeah. toolkit. Because for the continent, unfortunately, over the years, most of our agriculture policy instruments have focused on the big three, wheat, rice, and maize. And we've neglected our traditional and indigenous foods. And yet, if you look at climate resilience, some of the crops that are more resilient to the changes we are seeing in climate now are the melons and sorghums and the other foods that we have been neglecting. Yeah. So by taking that as part of our toolkit, that gives us an opportunity to diversify our food basket as well. And then if you look at then, if we bring on board uh, food-based dietary guidelines, then we can have that pool factor of right. actually creating a market for this. Um, associated with that is the, the African Development uh, uh, Agency, AUD and NEPAD. They are looking at school feeding as an entry point to catalyze investment right. in food systems transformation. And they too have picked traditional and indigenous foods to channel those into school feeding and use that as a pull factor from the production side right. to pull supply and generate uh, catalytic momentum in that direction. So there, are, I mean, if we do the right things, at least on paper, what we are saying we would like to do now ought to take us in a better direction. Yeah, it's so powerful, that pull factor that can really create more resilience, provide nutrition. And, you know, if, when we're talking about school feeding, making children more resilient to whatever shocks come down the line, whether it's another pandemic or, or something else. Adele, uh, Namakulo talked a little bit about a common vision. And I'm wondering from uh, a, you know, a policy and advocacy standpoint, do we need sort of a global campaign for how we think about um, driving changes in the mainstream policy sector? I think, I think we do, and I, I think there's a, there's a mix. Um, so I think when it comes to policy um, and business action, I think we do need global commitments with, which bring everyone to the table. But I think particularly with policy, it has to be so nuanced and place-based to ensure that uh, you know, the right strategies are in place for wherever it is around the world. I think what we do need a global, um, a global campaign on is, is, a, is, is consumer awareness around the importance of food uh, and the importance of supporting regenerative agriculture and how we as citizens of planet Earth can align our diets to the productive capacity of the land around us. We do obviously live in a very globalized world where you know, of course, I sit at, sit at home in the UK and drink coffee and eat bananas and chocolate. But I think thinking more about, OK, what can we produce sustainably um, within planetary boundaries in the place that we live? And how can we align our diets to, to, to that production system? I think we've got to be much more conscious about the land around us um, and, and think about how we live off the fat of our own land. An example um, from a UK perspective is... Um, now, because of the demonization of livestock and animal fats associated with them, which are actually very similar in chemical composi composition to plant fats like palm oil, um, in most kind of processed foods, which are a whole other problem in themselves, but in most processed foods is palm oil now on UK supermarkets, when actually the animal fats from largely grass-fed uh, beef and sheep production in the UK are burned around the back of abattoirs because there's no market for them. That's crazy. We're living off the fat of the Bornean rainforest when we have our own fats uh, from, you know, very actually very sustainable uh, places because they're grass-fed livestock. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a consciousness shift that needs to happen. And um, engaging the public needs to not just come from organizations like ourselves that speak to people who are already somewhat engaged in these issues. We need to start engaging people through popular co culture, sport, music, um, and, uh, and really think about how we, how we reach people who don't yet know so much about these issues. And I think that's the real challenge, but also opportunity for the next few years to come. It is an opportunity. How likely, given the urgency of the climate crisis, our health crisis, do you think that will happen? I think it has to happen. Um, and, 
you know, an, an example is, is what happened with our food system during COVID, and obviously I can't speak for exactly how it worked in all, in all corners of the world, but we suddenly had this global issue where food couldn't move around like it did before, and food that was being sold into restaurants couldn't get sold into restaurants anymore, and suddenly it had to be redirected mm -hmm. into, the, into the supermarkets or the corner shops or wherever it was that people were buying food. Mm -hmm. um, and the public reacted to that. And again, you know, talking of, of what happened at home in the UK, suddenly people, you know, because they were perhaps worried about going to the supermarket where lots of other people were, they were buying veg boxes from local farmers. And, and suddenly, within two weeks, the entire food system changed because of a big global shock. And yes, the climate crisis, uh, you know, it, it may not create such a global shock wave at one particular moment. M maybe it will, who knows? Um, but I, I do think uh, the public is ready to respond. We just need to give them the tools and also the information for them to respond to. Um, Bruce, I would pose the same question to you. Is the public ready to s respond to things like cellular agriculture, cultivated meat, slaughter-free meat, whatever you, we, we want to call it? Because you, when I came upon you today in the, the waiting room, you were watching a, an announcement by the United Nations Environment Program. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Danny, and uh, thank you. Really uh, delighted to be on this panel talking about such a, a critical uh, issue. So the United Nations Environment Program, uh, literally an hour and 15 minutes ago, uh, Inger Anderson had a press conference uh, about a new report that they have called What's Cooking? And What's Cooking is about um, alternative proteins, and in this iteration of alternative proteins, we're talking about things that are designed to replicate the exact same experience to the consumer um, of eating animal meat. Um, so that can be, you can use, uh, generally it's uh, plant-based or cellular agriculture. Plant-based meat is, you know, meat is made up of uh, fats, proteins, minerals, and water. You can replicate that precise experience using plants. Um, or with cultivated meat, uh, just like you can take a seed or a cutting from a plant and grow an entire plant, you can do the same thing with a small sampling of cells from a chicken or a pig or a fish. Um, and they were talking about the benefits. Um, and interestingly, they were talking uh, significantly about global health. Um, so the gl climate benefits and the land use benefits um, are probably fairly well understood. Um, industrial animal agriculture, 20% uh, of direct emissions and three quarters of global land use attributable to uh, industrial animal agriculture. Less well understood, which I was really glad to see the UNEP focus on, um, are pandemic risk and antimicrobial resistance. The UK government has said the threat to the human race from antibiotic resistance, antimicrobial resistance, is more certain than the threat from climate change. Right now, 70% of medically relevant antibiotics, antimicrobials, are fed to farm animals, um, not to human beings. And the UNEP previously in 2020, along with the International Livestock Research Institute and CGIAR, CGIAR uh, released a report called Preventing the Next Pandemic. Um, so I think 14 of the world's leading zoonotic disease experts, and they listed the seven most likely causes of the next pandemic, and the first one uh, was increased animal agriculture, um, and the second one was industrial animal agriculture, um, and six of the seven were linked to animal agriculture. So you like think about all of that um, in the context of we've got 27 years until we hit 2050, in the last 27 years, uh, meat production globally has gone up 80%. Um, if you include seafood, it's gone up even a little bit more than that. Um, all of the predictions are that it will do something like that in the next 27 years. Um, so if this is already a huge risk for climate, a huge risk for biodiversity, a huge risk for food security, as well as antimicrobial resistance and pandemic risk, and we're gonna you know, see that much more, um, figuring out how we can take a page from renewable energy and electric vehicles. Sure. And uh, this is not a silver bullet. It's one arrow uh, in the quiver. Uh, but the advantages are significant if we can figure out how to make meat from plants that don't require that consumers change their diets. Um, literally, from the vantage of the consumer, it's the exact same experience, sure. but at a lower price with plant-based meat. Um, and with cultivated meat, it's the exact same product. Uh, but if it's seafood, it doesn't have dioxins or mercury contamination. Um, if it's land animal meat, it doesn't have the bacterial contamination, doesn't have the antibiotic residues. It's a, a huge move in the right direction. Thanks for all of that. I mean, one thing that strikes me and it makes me want to come back to Surav and, and Afshan 
is that the, U the United Nations Environment Program took that on, took on this announcement today. They're looking at things holistically in a way that we haven't before, right? And so how do we get the health, food, and climate sectors to start looking at things more holistically because they haven't? And, and I, there are so many policies within climate, health, and, and food and agriculture that could sort of build on, on one another, on each other, but they don't because you don't have ag ministers talking to finance ministers or finance ministers talking to health ministers, et cetera. How do we better integrate all of that? So part of the Sun movement is exactly that. It's a national coordinator based at the national level under the office of the president or the prime minister that brings together the key stakeholders in agriculture, in health, in climate, in environment, right? Um, and really with the view to seeing how do these national nutrition plans and nationally determined contributions intersect and what kind of changes do they do we need? So I, I want to come back to something Nam, Namkolo said because it's very important and that's the locally produced nutritious foods, climate resilience, crops, large-scale food fortification, reducing food loss and waste, and public food procurement that right. focuses on both nutrition and emissions. Because as you rightly pointed out, we need to look at sustainability, biodiversity, agricultural resi resilience, and adaptability, but also preventing ballooning costs to the healthcare system. And I raise that because the most recent countries to join the Sun Movement are actually from Latin America. And their biggest concern is overweight and obesity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And that when we look at some of the Caribbean countries and the Pacific Islands with a shift in, in how people um, work and workforce and with a shift in dietary patterns, we're seeing an exponential growth in, in non-communicable diseases. And that requires really advocacy for a shift to healthy diets with, as you all said, consumers and communities at the heart. It's aware, an awareness raising. It's when government is procuring food, and sometimes we forget what a big procurer of food Absolutely, government yeah. is, whether it's for education systems, hospitals, military, prisons. How do you make sure that that's a healthy plate, sure. healthy diet, and conscious of that? Um, and then I think <clears throat> linking nutrition into primary health care. There's a lot more that can be done and particularly when we look at um, countries with acute malnutrition, where we piggyback those services together so you get better efficiency gains around your primary health care outreach right. and your nutrition screening. Thank you, Afshan. Sirav? Um, I think we need a two-pronged approach, really, the top-down and the bottom-up. So top-down, essentially, from, obviously, the government and the regulators, but it's easier said than done because departments don't like working together, including in the UK or anywhere else, for that matter. Uh, their first job, obviously, is to keep their chairs secure, So, and the second job is to take care of us. Um, but I think a holistic approach is um, absolutely necessary. Health, uh, food and agriculture, the departments, relevant departments need to work together in synergy. And uh, that is probably the, the most strongest force that can um, you know, help us get there. Um, as far as the bottom-up approach, uh, that I think could work obviously is uh, obviously involving the civil society and uh, helping them evolve their food behaviors or consumption behaviors. Uh, just to give an example uh, from, I was just speaking to Afsan um, before um, the panel. Um, the global nutrition report indicates uh, the sodium intake um, targets that we have for India, uh, we are nowhere close to that. The reason is very, very much so the traditional food habits, but uh, the lifestyle has changed. We don't sweat so much. We don't walk and uh, you know run or do any other sure. physical activities so much. So uh, if we don't help them evolve their food habits and, and uh, you know suggest how they can reduce sodium intake, uh, this is not going to happen. Changes won't come either with processed food or with cooked food or takeaways, whatever it is. So. Um, Making the civic society, civil society aware of these would be probably the very first step so that they can change their demands and likewise the food and agri can evolve. Thank you for that. So I, I want to switch gears and go back to Adele and Namakulo. I think there's been a lot of um, 
demonization of how we look at, at our food systems, like meat is bad, meat is good, um, and you know, farmers get somewhere caught in the middle, farmers and ranchers. How do we eliminate that sort of dichotomy where it's either you know, this food is bad or this food is good? Adele, do you want to take that on first? Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a really critical issue because it, it's incredibly confusing for people at the moment. And I think ultimately, as is the case with most solutions, it's probably somewhere in the middle with everything. Um, and I think what we need to combat that is transparency and consistent, robust measurement of impact. Mm -hmm. um, I often have the conversation, you know, is it regenerative agriculture? Is it agroecology? Is it climate smart? Is it nature friendly? I, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. And actually, who are we to tell, you know, smallholder communities, let's say, what their type of agriculture is called? What we need to all align around is the impact of different farming systems, so that can then be followed through up the supply chain to understand the impact of different food products. And if we can agree on a, on a common set of metrics at farm level, which empower farmers to understand the, the sustainability of their whole system, um, but also incrementally how they can be a little bit better each year if they need to be, or you know, if they're already amazing, at least be able to tell the world the amazing things they're doing. Um, and that can then be used in, in multiple ways, including for allowing finance to throw, flow through to agriculture in a different way. Governments, banks, investors, insurers, um, you know, everyone who potentially has, has, a, has a role to play in financing the agricultural transition, but it could also be used to inform or underpin future so-called eco-labeling. And I, I really do not like that term, eco-labeling, very much, but I think what we do need uh, is greater transparency so citizens, when they're buying food, can make a decision based on a holistic understanding of impact. Right. And I think, I think if, we, you know, if, we, if we get to that point, it will become more clear what, you know, which, which things are part of the problem and which things are part of the solution. Um, so uh, just briefly, our, our project, the Global Farm Metric, is, is working to, 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 try and, to try and get there. So look it up, globalfarmmetric.org. <laughs> Namakula, can you comment on how we, we sort of quit this demonization of, of you know, blaming uh, you know, different sectors for our environmental uh, problems or health problems and really focus on making things more farmer and health centric? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> there's a lot of blaming that goes around uh, in terms of health issues. But I think what is really critical for me is being nuanced to the context. Um, what do you do with people in pastoralist settings uh, where their main livelihoods might be livestock. They can't get the grain in if they don't have livestock. So we need to think in terms of what is relevant, for example, for that setting. Um, you spoke about plant-based uh, foods. I don't have a problem with plant-based foods. But when you think in terms of uh, context, most of our fresh foods for Africa, for example, come from informal markets. That's the kind of setting that we are dealing with. So where is the plant-based food going to come from in that perspective? Yes, we can eat our pulses. They are in reach for some. They are not in reach for others. Then when we look at the continent, we're also picking up now things like even with fertilizers, we have such degraded soils that even putting fertilizer might not help us. Sure. So we need a holistic yeah. uh, perspectives that looks at everything. What rotational uh, systems do we bring on board that can actually help us uh, grow food? And in there, you can also include livestock playing a part. I think what we need to be very careful about is avoiding the copy-paste scenarios. Sure. So copy-pasting industrial animal production systems into pastoralist settings in the Horn of Africa, it's just a non-starter. Yeah. Um, and in other places as well. So I think that nuance is important in terms of what is relevant, where and how do you do it. The guidelines, the dietary guidelines we need to depend on in terms of helping us on how much to consume, 
um, what's relevant where. Because what I will advise in terms of dietary guidelines in a pastoralist setting versus what I will do in Geneva or some other place will actually be nuanced to that. We need to think very hard about what is sustainable sure. under those different contexts, and that's important. Absolutely. Bruce, I want you to comment on what's sustainable under a holistic context when we're talking about we don't want to copy and paste different systems where they don't work. Where does cellular agriculture fit into this? Yeah, I mean, I think um, listening to kind of the entire discussion and thinking about um, the global food system and sort of the global input analysis, um, I was remembering uh, back in 2010, uh, Jean Ziegler, who was the UN Global Envoy um, on food, uh, referred to biofuels as a crime against humanity. Mm. Um, and the UN was like, you don't speak for us. And he said, I should speak for you because uh, 100 million metric tons of corn and wheat uh, were going into a system that was dispossessing smallholders, dispossessing pastoralists. The land pressure and the crop pressure was rising the pr raising the price of land, raising the price of feed for food for people who had nothing. Um, and in that same UN report, it pointed out that 756 million metric tons of corn and wheat were being fed to farm animals. Um, a decade later, it's north of a billion metric tons of corn and wheat. Um, it's 270 million metric tons of soy. So what Ziegler referred to as a crime against humanity in one context is now 12 and a half times worse. Sure. And if we think about that going up by 70 to 100% by 2050, the land use pressures, the crop pressures, I mean, that is what is making it harder to be a smallholder, um, harder to do regenerative or agroecology, harder to be a subsistence fisher in that community, in that uh, context. So I think we need, you know, we need the small direct interventions, obviously, uh, but we do have a global food system that is right now, the deck is stacked pretty seriously against smallholders um, and against nutrition and against global health. Um, so I think we should be looking at sort of the policies that entrench that system and looking Absolutely. for alternatives and alternative proteins is one of the alternatives that requires a fraction of the land, a fraction of the inputs and so on. Sure. So it'd be a good transition. Sure. We're sadly running out of time and this is flashing at me, but I'm going to ask for you all to give a call to action based on this, this theme of food uh, and, and health and, and health is, uh, is our sort of um, global wealth. So Adele, if I can start with you, what's your call to action? for folks? I think, I mean, uh, my, I would love for my call to action would, to be let's all collaborate together on a global campaign for citizens, but I think the most tangible thing we can do following this COP is agree on common metrics for measuring farm level sustainability that can then kind of flow up and be layered up, up the supply chain. I think that's such an un unlocking mechanism for so many things, so that would be mine. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I mean, I think what we have seen with the NDCs outside of the food context um, is that putting teeth into them is not uh, self-affecting. It doesn't happen all by itself. So um, I'm incredibly motivated um, and inspired that we have 130 whatever countries signed on to adding food systems to their NDCs. Uh, we now need to make sure uh, that the NDCs, you know, that they actually take that seriously and that they have policies that follow. Um, that commitment. So I think really diving in on food and holding the country's you know, feet to the fire that have made this commitment. Fantastic, thank you. Namakula. Yeah, um, mine is very simple. I think we need to use the UN Food Systems Summit as an entry point for sustainability. It's the first time we have had multiple countries, right. more than 100, trying to do the same thing at the same time nuanced to their circumstances, all talking about wanting to go to better sustainability of our food systems, addressing climate, addressing nutrition. And so for me, that is a very unprecedented um, opportunity that we can actually Absolutely. work with and bringing investments into those efforts and ensuring that we minimize trade-offs there and transform positively for climate, for nutrition, uh, for the environment. That is the thing that I hope everybody actually remembers and walks away with. Me Thank too. You. Thank you for that. Afshan. Thank you. I, I really see malnutrition as the moral failure and human face 
of the, our failure in food systems, climate, and health. So I think picking up on Namkulo's point, can we get to a place where agri-systems are supporting good nutritional outcomes, right. where climate interventions are people positive, and where health interventions support better nutritional outcomes. Thank you, Afshan. Sura, final word. I think it's a message for the agri-food industry. Um, if they can compete to collaborate, rather than competing with each other, I think we would solve a big part of the problem. Great final word. Thank you all so much for being part of this great panel. Please give them a round of applause.